Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a returning guest who I think you're really going to enjoy. He's the head of the excellent organization Exit, and he's also a very good writer who does some very interesting podcasts and sub stacks. Ben, it's Phylactery. Thanks for joining me, man. Thanks. Good to be here. So you had this really good piece on kind of your latest episode, uh, latest piece out of your sub stack that I think is really important because it does a great job of taking a lot of things that people in our sphere talk about, but really has a, a lot of application, a lot of practical application and, and practical ways that you can apply the, these theories of power or, or the flow of power, these kind of things, analysis to, to kind of what's actually going on today. And you start it with, uh, by kind of making this review of this book. Uh, is it Robert McLuhan? I'm trying to remember his name real quick. David Kilcullen. Um, Kilcullen. That's, yeah, I just did. Okay. Uh, Kilcullen. But yeah, he did this book about kind of how the uh, the Taliban won and then kind of how the, uh, the the modern warfare is moving these insurgents out of the mountains and, the, and you know, the, these far off places and kind of into the cities and integrating into uh into the population and competing with other people who are supposed to be kind of the legitimate leaders of their of their country but you also talk about how this isn't related just to you know afghanistan this happens in many other countries and can happen in with with non-militaristic non-insurgent organizations as well and that's the stuff that i want to to focus on a little bit but to to start at the beginning can we talk a little bit ab about kind of setting the table? How does uh, one of these uh, factions end up capturing power? How does one of these non-state actors end up capturing power flows in maybe some of these third world countries and then we can kind of translate it over to how it happens in, in first world countries? Yeah, well, I think it actually starts by hiding out in the power flows. Um, it, it, it doesn't begin with... I think often it doesn't begin with a conscious effort to capture them. It's uh, to, to give you an example. Um, basically, a, a lot of things have to be going wrong. Um, there, there have to be sort of uh, the, the ideally, if it's a really strong state, what will happen is um, all of the tax revenues will be adequately collected and they'll be collected by the right people and they'll go to the right places. And then um, the benefits of the taxation, the, the, uh, the food stamps and the tuition subsidies and all those things will go to the appropriate people determined by policy. And um, that that's kind of what we call like in the West anti-corruption, like, like a, a, a function, like good governance basically means um, the state collects all of the resources and it distributes them to exactly who it intends to distribute them to. But in uh, these cities, uh, his thesis is that basically the, the the crowding and the chaos and and the limitations on state capacity in in cities, especially like cities in the developing world, they make it so that those power flows leak, right? Like the the police force can't watch all the cops, and so the cops start collecting bribes and they start moonlighting as protection forces for some gang. Um, and, and in that way, you know, in, in that case, it would be the gang, uh, they begin to capture the state's ability to prosecute violence. Um, but it can also be just any, any place where the state is dropping the ball, like, like uh, or, or even if they're not deliberately dropping the ball, where the state is just failing to deliver on a, a basic uh, thing that we expect states to do, like keep track of property rights. And so one of the important things the Taliban did was even in environments where they were not um, in power, like where they were literally like an underground cell in some community, they would start building like a shadow county recorder's office, a shadow ledger of property rights. And they would adjudicate and, and actually from, from what people said, adjudicate fairly. Like they would, they would really try to determine who had the best claim on you know, these water rights or this pasture or whatever it was. And what that did was it, it made it so that the people who basically adjudicated their property rights through the Taliban 
were uh, had skin in the game for the Taliban to succeed. Like when when uh, the the old man sends his son to go pick up a rifle and fight for the Taliban, he doesn't have to like be bought into the Taliban's ideological program, and neither does his son. It's it's really a question of like, well, if the Taliban doesn't win here, then the warlord who uh, usurped our property rights and took them away 20 years ago during the post-Soviet period, uh, he's going to ride back into town and take away our farm. So the Taliban better wins to go pick up a ride. And it's just fighting for the family farm. And you think about like um, the way that Shelby Foote characterized the Civil War in that Ken Burns doc. You ever see the Ken Burns Civil War? I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the Union soldiers, they're talking to some captured rebel and... Uh, they ask him like, you know, you're, you're a dirt farmer, just like us. You don't need slaves. Why are you fighting? And he's, his answer is because you're here. Like, right. He's fighting for his little, little, uh, uh, patch. And, and in that guy's mind, the, the, the insurgent, the Confederacy, uh, you know, it depends on how you look at it in his, in his mind, they weren't the insurgents, but the insurgent party is the guarantor and the defender of his rights. And so uh, you get you get alignment, and and I guess the fundamental uh, the way this book helped me see the world differently was he was like they're not actually competing over resources or competing over um, turf, they're competing for uh, the the compliance and cooperation of the population. Um, if I set the rules, who listens? Both because and, and it, it comes down, I don't know how, how far you want me to go with this, but, but it, it comes down to building a bubble that is very safe on the inside and very dangerous on the outside. And the Taliban had the benefit of like Afghanistan just being an incredibly dangerous place. So like they didn't have to make things much safer to, to make a bubble that felt pretty cozy to people. And uh, yeah. So yeah, no. Sorry. Yeah, I definitely want to get deeper into that uh, that aspect as well, because I think that's really important. But I do want to spend a second a, a, a little bit on on that capturing of power flows first, because the, I sure. thought that was very interesting that the way, you know, you kind of frame that was obviously a lot of these organizations do start out as basically just gangs. You know, they're they're just they're just, uh, you know, coercing compliance. But over time, you realize that actually that's not the best game in town and providing things that people need, like you said, making them feel safe inside your bubble is far more valuable to get them on your side than necessarily just showing up with a bunch of guns and breaking things until someone gives you money. And so the, uh, you know, the, the ability to kind of capture those essential factors from a government, especially governments that aren't able to do those things is really important. And another point you made that I liked was that a lot of times they will specifically, while they might need to be capable of violence, while they're this proto-state inside the state, while they are non-state actors at that time, they are careful about the things they usurp as to not trigger certain defense mechanisms inside the existing state. So if you're distributing food or aid or you're you're the one that makes sure that people get jobs or you know certain benefits from the government get handed down you become an essential part of the power flow of the government so they need you and they can't just dispose of you immediately but you also are building a power base inside that sphere because those people see you as the actual guarantor of the thing that's being distributed. And so you can build power inside without necessarily having to directly compete with, for instance, a monopoly on violence of the state. I mean, you've watched, we, we've watched NGOs do this, right? They capture so much power just by routing the flows and, um, and people are very grateful for that. And I actually, I mean, I think even, even street gangs primarily, uh, to the extent that they do have the buy-in of the population, it's it's because they are uh, they're coercing coercers. It's like you, you you join the gang like it's like a prison gang. Like uh, you you join the gang because if you don't join a gang, then you're all alone and you're a, you're a target. But um, inside inside the gang, there's protection, and then like even things like a protection racket, those are uh, 
characterized as this really negative parasitic thing uh, in developed countries because we, we, we think that we have um, that taken care of by the police. But in an environment where that's not being taken care of by the police or the police are even uh, uh, executing some, some extra legal violence, then a protection racket uh, it's sort of just a competitive provider for security services. And, 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 you know, when they, when they say like, you know, nice shop, it'd be a shame if something happened to it. They're not just talking about like, we're going to break your windows. It's like, well, there's a couple other gangs around here who might shake you down. And, and if, if they come to you and you're paying us your protection money, then we'll go get them. And so like, there's a, it, I think basically it's a mistake to characterize these institutions, even these like informal illegal institutions as totally parasitic because it misunderstands why people, why people defend them, why they protect them, why they, you know, tolerate them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so you, you call this the, the system of competitive control, right? Is that, that you have these, these different uh, actors that are working inside the same state simultaneously. One is officially the state, one is the non-state actor. And, and they might be in, in many ways butting up against each other. They might, they might be hostile, but in many ways they might also be, like I said, uh, or like you, you say in the piece, that they might be reliant on each other in certain areas. There might be certain areas of overlap where one of the power flows has been captured, but and now you have these spheres of competitive control because the state can't actually provide the thing that the, you know, the warlord or the Taliban or the, you know, the political machine inside New York can provide to the people and, or the NGO, you know, all these, all these uh, actors are not necessarily the, the, what makes them hard to discard is the fact that they do provide a aspect of the state that is expected that no one else can can provide um, now you also talk about the importance of media top cover um, which i think is very essential because uh, as you point out in the piece it's very easy for uh, two different conflicts to have two groups with competing spheres of control one of those uh, conflicts the insurgent will get very favorable uh, media coverage every time the state actor has some kind of violence that tries to enforce its control of the area. In the other one, they'll just get completely destroyed in the press as like horrific terrorists who are who are just taking out children. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of media top cover and why it's important for these organizations that don't get favorable media top cover to understand how to work without it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it just, it just drastically limits what you can safely do. I mean, you, you look at like the Arab Spring and because those people had uh, favorable attention, not from not just from the mass media, but from social media companies, uh, they were able to like, th there was, there was a, a Russian missile launcher that the Libyans were using. And like they were sharing uh, the, the intimate details of that missile launcher on Twitter and like how to take it out. And obviously uh, anyone who didn't have favorable uh, top cover from, from not just the media, not just social media, but also American intelligence, uh, there's no way. I mean, that, that would be, uh, you know, imagine if the situations were reversed. Imagine, right. <laughs> like imagine if somebody, if somebody uh, uh, you know, who was, who was an opponent of, of that intelligence bureaucracy tried something like that. Um, and and I mean it, it changes how you can how you can coordinate. I, I also think like it's it's not just that um, outside actors co-opt or usurp elements of state capacity. In a lot of cases, these are rogue components of the state. I mean that's that's mm. essentially what what the IC has become, the intelligence community. That's essentially what. Uh, I, I tell a story of this Jamaican gangster who was basically like a, a community organizer for the the uh, right wing, whatever that means, party in Jamaica. Uh, they sort of have a, a Republican Democrat split, like most sort of uh, bipartisan systems do. But um, he he essentially was like the, uh, the 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 door knocker for those guys, 
And, and by securing the ability to get votes, he ended up securing all kinds of lucrative government contracts and favorable housing and, and, and by so doing became the, uh, they didn't think of those things as services they were getting from the Jamaican government. They thought of them as things they were getting from the Don. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that turned out to be true because if the other party won the election, they would come in like bulldoze. Uh, the, the housing developments and, and, and shut off your water and your sewer and all kinds of things. So, um, so like it, it can begin either outside or inside the state. It's basically just, does the state have the power to like monitor and control every step of the power flow? And, and that ultimately like where, where we're at right now, it, the, the thing that, the thing that dissident, groups are afraid of has almost nothing to do with like, like, uh, uh, Biden and, and, and like Eric Swalwell talk about like, you know, your AR 15 isn't going to mean much if there's an F 15 or a, or a, a predator drone circling overhead. Right. So why bother like give up your, your AR 15, but as nobody's worried about being struck by a predator drone. They're worried about being targeted by the intelligence community. They're worried about being targeted by the media, and and surveilled. and And those are the those are the aspects of state power that are still really ironclad. Like nobody can hack into your uh, Discord like the NSA can. Nobody can watch you from orbit like the National Reconnaissance Office. Like it's there's there's just uh, um, those are the, like, it, it used to be like states were in power because they were the only people that could field tanks and jets and aircraft carriers. But the, the actually the media has sort of replaced that tool, uh, because if you use tanks and jets and aircraft carriers and the media is going to have something to say about it, positive or negative. And that, um, that sort of drives how useful those tools are to you as you see with, uh, Gaddafi and, and, uh, and, and, uh, Bashar al-Assad, like they, they, they pay a much higher price for, uh, for going through neighborhoods and blowing holes in things than for instance, the IDF does in, in Gaza or the West bank. Um, and that's, that's the importance of, of media top cover. Yeah, it really is. Uh, like you said, the optics really do matter even for a government like ours, which theoretically controls all of these uh, these media institutions, you still have to be very care careful. Like you said, the the you know Joe Biden you know uh, dropping a bunch of bombs on some you know chud neighborhood in in uh, Alabama is still going to have a huge impact, right? Like that's still a lot of media fallout, and so uh, those those uh, finesse instruments are really key. They they allow people to be uh, targeted very specifically, very surgically. Uh, and and this is a, a part that I really like that I think is very important without that you talked about without disrupting the idea that there are rules, right? Everybody yes. wants to know that there are rules. There's things I can do to avoid being targeted. And most people need to know that there's a stability inside the system where even if I think these rules are totalitarian, even if I think these rules are in a, you know, some infringement on my constitutional rights, whatever that's worth at this point, at least there are rules that I can hold you to, right? And and the and and so these soft implements allow people to say, well, I didn't cross this very specific line. So the IRS won't be auditing me, the FBI won't be knocking on my door. And the more the regime is willing to violate that certainness and stability in rules, even if there are rules that are harsh and unfair, is the more that it, it makes the, the safety inside its sphere uh, feel less secure. And what media can do is they can frame you as out of, out of harmony with the rules. That mm -hmm. what, like, because uh, uh, essentially, if you believe that like, for instance, Waco, uh, if you believe that they were just targeted because they were sort of conservative and Christian and, and, and all that stuff, then it's like, well, that could, that could have been us. It's just anybody who, anybody who tries to, uh, build something separate from the system, some like, 
uh, compound in the woods is going to get Wacoed. But there's another uh, voice in that conversation that's saying like, no, actually there was like, you know, he married an underage kid and that was like technically legal, but like super weird. And like he was stockpiling guns and, and, and since I don't do that, I'm, 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 I'm probably okay. Like, like there's, there's specific sets of things that he did that like triggered that response. And we go, well, I just won't do those things. I can still be a conservative Christian. I can still be, you know, um, it's, it, it's a question of like, even if you're the hegemon and you're in control of everything, including the media, uh, you, you are limited in your ability to just target anybody you don't like, because like you're saying, the more you do that, the, the, the more people start to think, I have no idea how to be safe within this system. And so my buy-in to my, my, what the state provides me essentially is predictability is order. And, and if, and if, if the state becomes to me the equivalent of like just a gang that hasn't shook me down yet because I haven't caught their attention yet, um, then you start looking for alternatives. You start looking outside that system and the more dramatic that violation is, uh, the more of those types of alternatives prop crop up and the more uh, extreme they become in their methods. Now, another thing related to this that you talked about is how people just want equilibrium. Like we're talking about, they just want a system where they know they're safe, they know they're secure and a large amount of people are just non-political. They just want the state to resolve these state these questions for us and that's really weird for a lot of people to hear i think because today we look around and we're like everything's political everyone has an opinion everyone is charged everyone has to be an activist all the time and we feel like this is just a natural state of humanity that like every person is just walking around hyper charged up with this obsession about politics and ready to just you know disown their family and their friends and and, and leave their church and and never see anyone again if they have the slightest disagreement on some kind of uh you know trade policy or whatever and so i think it's hard for people to understand that but i think that um a big part of that like you said is the the lack of equilibrium it's it's that our system is specifically designed to constantly be uh in revolution in a state of revolution that's that's how our system is designed and because of that we are we're just tricked into believing that actually everyone wants to constantly be involved in this democratic process when the vast majority of time you don't need to win everybody all the time you don't need to you don't need to convince everyone all the time the vast majority of people will just go where power is going as long as they know that that power is going to be stable and reliable and they're not going to get got by that quick shift of frame and and rule if uh, when they're just going about their day yeah because if 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 it, you know if you live in the if you live in the 90s in america or like almost any time besides right now um freedom to you is like uh, low and stable inflation and, um, low taxes and, uh, you know, being sort of, being sort of left alone because you're ambitious, like you're not trying to change the world. You're trying to like make money. You're trying to raise a family. Like freedom, freedom is a question of what you want to do in the world. Like, are you, are you free? It depends on what you want, right? Like, am I free to do what? So, so for most people, uh, the first amendment is almost irrelevant to them because they don't actually want to talk about politics, certainly not in public. And, and, you know, some of them want to go to church and, you know, it's important to them, I guess, that they are allowed to go to their church. Um, but like the, the big, like philosophical questions of like, of like, what rights do we have as Americans? they're not concerned about that. They're just concerned about like, t tell me what I got to do to, to be able to ignore all that. Like to, to not have to think about it so that I can get back to what I actually care about, which is making money and raising, raising a family. And I, I think what's increasingly happening in the, in our system is the basics are uh, being interfered with the basics of being able to raise a family, the basics of being able to, to find a mate, the basics of being able to get an education and a job, like 
it's it's starting to hit a political people where it hurts and then they all and then they get interested in politics right because politics is interested in them um but but ultimately yeah i mean it, it's the same group of people who are um shrieking on social media about whatever the current thing is um especially especially like the, the 40 50 year old white women like in the 90s they were like 20 30 year old white women and they weren't like this like this is this is new this is something different this isn't like part of their genetics it's not part of their like soul it's there's something's happened to the incentive structure and um and i think yeah, it, it, it's 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 a search. For, it's, it's it's in fact a search for equilibrium. They're trying to find what the rules are and stabilize them, and uh, so that they can be safe. And and so so paradoxically, you've got conservatives who are trying to find equilibrium by saying, um, "Wait, wait, wait. We 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 already agreed on some things, and I'm asking you to hold to your agreement. I want to." I just want to live in the America of the nineties or the America of the two thousands or the America right after Obergefell, which is a lot of what these, where these conservatives are at. Like yeah, where it's just take me now, back yeah. to the golden days of 2016. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's how they're searching for equilibrium. And then, and then progressives, their search for equilibrium is, is more like, just tell me what you want. Do you want me to, to the trans flag? Are we putting more stuff on the trans flag? Oh, like, okay. Okay, sure. Just let me just let me get back to work. You know? <laughs> and, and one sympathizes kind of like there's there's like a there's a there's a, they they do I think most of them have a belief that like because they're not they're not again they're not political they're not really considering the long view. They've been told that there's this injustice and once this injustice is rectified then it'll be rectified and we can all just we can we can live in a better world. And uh, and and what they are failing to to understand is that it's never going to stop and um and it's it's not going to equilibrate so yeah that's that's uh that's how that works seems to well me. yeah well, one of the things about why it won't equilibrate that you bring up is the the need to optimize inclusion right is is the the system is optimized to bring the most number of people under the mediating power of not just the united states but the actual western he hegemon right and mm -hmm. so the so this need to uh to kind of destroy the equilibrium is is always because you're trying to include more and more people you uh, being able to negotiate the needs of more and more subgroups in order to kind of add them under the coalition this is kind of a dovetails into one of the the general liberal critiques of liberalism that it can't possibly mediate all these that eventually you hit these existential conflicts and you will get necessary uh you know that kind of these necessary uh conflicts w will occur but i think it was very interesting that like the the search to bring as many people under the control of the system is the thing that is constantly forcing it to actually destabilize or de Deequilibrio lies, however, the best proper way to say that is. Uh, Disequilibrate? Yeah, I, that's yeah. probably right. <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, and it becomes a Procrustean bed, right? Because um, in order to make in order to make Muslims and Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Satanists all get along, uh, you have to like chop off all the rough edges of all those of all those belief systems, and you have to say like, well, okay, like you can be Christian, but you can't you can't like, be that Christian, right? you know, you can be Muslim, but you can, come on, like you gotta, you gotta compromise with this. And the more people you bring into that tent that have more diversity of, uh, of opinion and, and values, the more you have to chop off of everybody to, to, to make them fit. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and it, it is, I mean, it's the essence of democracy, really. One of the things that, uh, is interesting about this, like this Jamaican gangster is, he had immense power because there were like tens of thousands of people whose uh, whose vote was worth a lot. Like, especially as you bundled them, right? And so he could go to these people who have essentially no um, 
you know, economic role in the society, right? And, and, and never have intergenerationally and say, you, you got to vote and, 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 and I'll get you, I'll get you the housing project and I'll get you the food stamps and we'll, you know, school supplies and all this stuff. And by its nature, sort of this, this, this democratic meme, this democratic system of, of, of elections with one person, one vote, it, it, it almost has to expand because whichever whichever component of that system can pull in new people gets power over the other side of the system. You know, uh, uh, one political party says, well, we ought to let uh, white males vote even if they don't own land. And then they win tons of elections. And then, they, well, we ought to probably let um, these freed slaves vote. And that's a, a massive boon to them. And we ought to let women vote. And, we, you know, ultimately... And, and now basically it's like, well, we're not going to probably not going to let kids vote. So uh, how are we going to how are we going to gain power over our enemies? Well, we'll just import uh, voters and that's how we'll do it. And then it becomes uh, rather than um, sort of borders of, of, of gender, borders of ethnicity, borders of, of, of class uh, being sort of uh, dissolved in the soup. Now it's the now it's the borders of the nation. Uh, because, you know, you have to talk to them as if they matter just as much as Americans uh, to you personally. Like, even if it's your job to care about Americans. Well, it's no longer your job to care about Americans. It's your job to care about Hoover Ukraine. up. Yeah. Well, just, yeah, just, just, <laughs> yeah. just Hoover up whatever power there is in the system, right? right? It's Ukrainians, it's, it, but it's Mexicans and Guatemalans. It's, it's, it's sort of you. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's no equilibrium in that system. And, and, the uh, the benefits that you can throw to like a weird minority group, for instance, um, I, I, a lot of the a lot of the like sexual culture war stuff is that the the little minority. I mean, it works the same as like sugar subsidies. You got I don't know if you know this. We have like we have like outrageous sugar subsidies in the I U.S., do, yeah. and it's because uh, the sugar farmers care way more about sugar subsidies than anybody else. So like, there's not a coherent constituency that's like real mad about sugar subsidies, but the, but the, but there is this huge incentive gradient to support sugar subsidies because the, the, you get the farmers on your side and, um, and lobbying dollars, et cetera. And I think it's the same with these like <laughs> boutique sexual minorities. It's like, th like they're going to, they're going to go to the mattresses for that stuff. And right up until very recently, when it became about kids, there wasn't uh, there wasn't like a really headstrong constituency against any of that stuff. And now it's it's like it's really up against the wall of like, all right, but 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 these are my kids. We're not like there's starting to be a, a, an, an opposing constituency to some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how democracy eats all of these distinctions because there's power in breaking them down. There's, there's a, an, a, an activation energy. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like burning fuel. Yeah. Th this was I actually, was just talking to, to Paul Gottfried about this, that the Carl Schmidt coined the term, the total state by saying that this is something that's going to happen in any democracy because by necessity, now the state, which used to have monopoly on the political now must penetrate the social. And now that these two spheres have crossed, there's no way to keep the state from eventually just consuming every other sphere of influence because every one of these is a possible way in which it can generate more power. And leaving it alone is a play is a way that another non-state actor could secure one of the power flows. And so the total state has to come eventually into democracy because if you don't control every power flow as the state, then someone else does and you could lose sovereignty. And so you really have to do this. And like you said, you, you, they, you know, they have to chop off all these rough edges, which it, again is, is also something predicted by the man, you know, managerial revolution that the managers would need to kind of remove all these rough edges so you can 
mediate most of these conflicts and you can also manage most of these people with with similar uh with similar plans though i do think it is funny that uh while everything else it seems to have the edges it needs to get chopped off satanism i don't know seems to fit just fine into this in this scene so seems seems like every aspect of satanism from you know uh from transgender surgeries to the sacred right of abortion fits right into to the whole managerial <laughs> scheme quite quite the coincidence yeah it's uh it, well, it, it ultimately, it, it's the the only rule is there's no rules. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's those are uh, kind of two ways. Like, the, the paradox of tolerance is basically the same thing as do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Like, that's <laughs> they're the same thing. And 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 yeah, it's 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 necessary to the survival of liberalism that uh, that all all uh personal and institutional boundaries be abolished so one other thing that you talked about that i wanted to make sure that we got to was the importance of aggression framing uh this this dovetails with uh media top cover but the how important it is for people uh, who are who are doing this stuff to frame uh, themselves as kind of the defender and the other person as the aggressor. So for instance, as we see with the United States uh, in kind of this Russia-Ukraine conflict, it doesn't matter if the United States and, and NATO in general have broken like a large number of their promises in the attempt to like hedge in Russia. If Russia throws the first punch, even though this punch was gonna happen inevitably, they're the bad guy. And so it's really important for these non-state actors or just even state actors to be very careful about their their aggression framing and show, you know showing casting it as who's the one who's actually throwing the first move, move especially if you don't have that media top cover that can yeah. frame it the way you want it to. Yeah, and it, it it takes a lot of effort even for a state actor to engineer the circumstances such that they don't look like the aggressor. I mean, you know, uh and I, I don't know that I don't know that necessarily there's any nefarious plan to um, to hurt Russia uh, on the on the part of NATO. I think I think NATO is an anti-Russian alliance. Yeah, and, and so, so it's just doing its job. Yeah, it's just doing its job. And 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 there's not there's not like a not like a person at the wheel of that thing to say like maybe this is stupid. Like why are we why are we mad at the Russians again? I don't know, but uh, it's just like this is our sort of mission is to, is to oppose these people. And, and, um, and this absorption of new allies um, who then get access to all sorts of new uh, weapons manufactured by the, uh, mm -hmm. the military industrial complex, you know, there's just, there's just this really strong incentive gradient to find it's, it's finding markets basically uh, uh, markets for markets for fighter aircraft markets for artillery and missiles and, and uh, the more you can expand that sphere of influence, the more you sell. And and just by vert, like <laughs> they framed it in this really interesting way. It's like, oh, we're not. You, you can watch the map of like NATO like creeping east toward Russia, and it's like, oh no no, we're not we're not uh, actually like becoming the hegemon of these. It's just we're just protecting this guy and we're protecting this guy and we're protecting. We're just keeping everybody safe. We're just in the business of keeping everybody safe. And. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and then and then Russia uh, hits one of them, and it's like, ah, we're we're vindicated, you know, we we uh, we told these Eastern European countries that they had to watch out for you, and and here, look what you did, you you uh, you earned all of this uh, all of this effort on our part, retroactively. <laughs> but so, yeah, it, it makes oh. them look like the uh, it, it makes them look from from a the, the perspective of an idiot in a hurry you know, just sort of watching the news and, and sort of accepting whatever the framing is, it, 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 it makes them look like the good guy and it makes the Russians look like the bad guy. Yeah. And so that means it's, it's really important for anyone who's doing this to, to kind of understand. And again, not all this needs to be military. Again, one of my favorite points that you made in here is that how effective the, you know, the, again, the NGO type stuff is right. That has nothing to do with with any kind of uh in any kind of violence they're just people who are 
you know, in who are insinuating themselves in the core actions of the state without, you know, uh, with a, that are that are totally peaceful, but the state can't can't completely control, and therefore these people kind of gain power. But I wanted to talk a little bit now, transitioning to uh, the practical application of this in our scenario, because for instance, I, we do have people, I think, finally in the conservative or right-wing movement that are understanding and taking action on pieces of this. Uh, Chris Rufo is probably the most prominent, but people like Corey DeAngelis are also doing this. They've really targeted especially the education system, which is, I think, really important because it's a, it's a power flow. People expect the state at this point, for better or for worse, to educate their children, to, to basically create child care uh, to to credential their children uh, so that they can get uh, employment opportunities, socialize their children. They expect all of these things. And right. the fact that the Democratic Party, the left, the progressives have an almost entire monopoly on this and that there's an entire NGO complex. I mean, you know, uh, Bill Gates builds Common Core so he can basically just standardize and monopolize education policy throughout the United States. Uh, means that there's just a vast amount of power that is controlled by these organizations. And guys like DeAngelis and Rufo understand this, and they're actively targeting this monopoly and trying to wrest control of it from the state through, you know, uh, vouchers and through conversion of, 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 you know, legislation, this kind of thing in order to, to, to kind of create a, a parallel or, a, or, a, or a, some kind of option outside of the system so that the state doesn't, doesn't completely control this. Do you think that's a, an example? Do you see other examples where this is happening? Yeah, I mean, the, the sexual revolution, women, women uh, going into the workforce, I mean, that was like the splitting of the atom in terms of mm -hmm. the energy that was released by that because what did that do? It all of a sudden made like every American family dependent on uh, childcare. And the state had this apparatus of like, oh, we would be happy to acculturate your children for 12 years of their lives. Uh, like by all means, to go to work and, and, and leave your kids with us. And um, for a long time, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it was I don't think in my lifetime that's been the smart move. Uh, like I don't, I don't, I think, I think a lot of what I was taught in school was pretty screwed up too. But now it's becoming this like really existential problem of like, wow, um, I need to, I need to be able to support my family on a single income because I cannot send my kids to these schools. And I, I mean, it's it's an enormous, enormous power flow, both both in terms of the the activist apparatuses that it that it nourishes, both you know, because there's so many academics, there's so many like stupid master's degrees that the only way those master's degrees earn a living is because there's a public school system. And, and so there's that, that activist network in the universities. And then you've got the sort of activists on the ground, which is the teachers um, who, uh, you know, they, they get paid to basically um, inculcate the state's values into your kids. And if you take that power flow, I've said this more than once. If I could get them to just take my education tax dollars and light them on fire, <laughs> be a be massive a better, improvement, yeah. a massive yeah. improvement, because then at least that power flow is not being captured by people who are inimical to everything. I like they, they hate my guts and want me to die. Like just light it on fire, please. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it, from, from, from Rufo's perspective, He's got this really interesting, he's placed a wedge between what people are told about the purpose of the school system and what its actual purpose is. And um, I think I think what I said was it's it's bullshit, but it's load bearing bullshit. I don't know if we can, but yeah, yeah anyway, you're fine. Um, it, it, it's uh, because what people are supposed to believe about the schools is that the schools are employed by you, the taxpayer, right? Like you're and there's the PTA and you're, you're in, you're in control of what your kids are, are learning. It's just, uh, you know, you don't have the time and you maybe don't have the expertise to teach them, you know, uh, uh, derivatives. And, 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 and so, uh, 
or, or, or history or whatever. So, so you, you, you outsource that to people who basically share your interests. Um, and so Rufo's saying like, well, there's all kinds of people who could teach your kids that. And, uh, you know, these, these, these tax monies ostensibly belong to you. They're for this purpose of, of uh, educating your children the way you want them educated, right? So let's, let's just take those monies and let you uh, decide where you want them. And he's daring the state to go like, actually, you're not allowed to do that because <laughs> it's really important to us to be able to tell your kids about butt stuff. And, um, and, and, and so, uh, so that's, I mean, that's genius. And I think um, another power flow that is being uh, left on the ground, so to speak, there's a massive amount of talent in the corporate uh, employment system that is being uh, either explicitly forced out through like, hey, we're just not hiring any white guys anymore, or implicitly forced out through you got to get the jab and you got to wear the flare and you got to put your pronouns and you got to do like there's there's a massive outflow of talent. Um, and I think it was uh, I think it was on your show, uh, uh, Moldbug was saying, you know, I'd still rather go to Harvard than, uh, than Lambda School. Um, but I think you were right to say um, there is an inflection point at which the people outside there are so high quality and the people inside there are so mediocre uh, that if you want anything meaningful accomplished, you have to look outside. And it would be good to be one of the people who was running the institution that's that's outside. Um, I think, I mean, uh, ultimately, um, the the capital that that it, it, it's about owning your capital, right? Like on an individual level, personal level. Uh, I'm not thinking about like the big political system, but like, um, and, and you, know, <laughs> there's just endless debate on like right wing Twitter about like should we all go be plumbers. Uh, you know, or farmers or whatever. And I, I think that's a stupid argument because nobody who shouldn't be a plumber is, is, is trying to be a plumber right now. But, but, uh, but basically what a plumber has, what a homesteader has, what a software developer has that like a project manager at Amazon does not have is ownership of their capital. Um, they own the tools that allow them to do their job. They own their book of business, their customer base, they get to decide um, whether or not and how they make money. And that's immensely liberating. And so, uh, I mean, my whole thing, the, the, the way that I'm trying to, uh, to, to, to capture some of those power flows is I'm, I'm getting guys together to, to learn uh, how to build those kinds of businesses and, 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 and be more sovereign in terms of their income so that they can go, uh, so they can send their wife home to raise the kids so that they can get their kids out of the government schools so that they can move jurisdictions if they need to uh all of the things that put pressure on uh these these institutions that really that that, that take our compliance completely for granted is there a name for this organization someone yeah if they were interested in this kind of thing that they could <laughs> something yeah, they could exit, join to do this there exit group <laughs> exit group.us yeah come check us out it's it's uh it, it's basically um it's a fraternal organization we're, we're working on both individual projects and group projects uh some of the guys are trying to start a shrimp farm we're doing a literary competition we're doing uh a uh um we're doing a code boot camp. There's a bunch of different projects. Uh, we're launching a conference later this year. Um, but like on the individual level, it's like meet people who can sh explain SEO to you, explain marketing, explain web design, like get in touch with people who are like-minded, who, who have answers to some of your questions about, uh, about starting a business or, or a side hustle or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's like, and, and, uh, is that the, um, is that going to save America? Uh, maybe I <laughs> it's, uh, but I'm trying to tend my little garden, you know, I'm trying to, mm -hmm. I'm trying to carve out my little slice. And, um, and ultimately the, what I see happening is you get enough people who are, are sovereign in that respect. And again, freedom is a question of what you want to do. Right. Um, but, but, but sovereign enough to speak their minds. And, and this is something that I talk about and that, that Kilcullen talks about in his book. 
is the ability to absorb punishment and how important that is to the um, to the framing of yourself as the good guy and 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 the other the bad guy as the aggressor, right? Is if you can if you can take the first punch, and that's that's why the strong horse is so powerful in like in like uh, Ukraine, right? Part of the reason that Russia's in the situation they're in is that they really couldn't afford to take the first hit. Like they wouldn't survive that. And but but the US could. They could they could let Ukraine kind of absorb that first blow and then just pump, pump. I mean, just like they did with the Russians in World War II. You know, let let the Nazis get all the way to Stalingrad, but then there's just Bradley after Bradley after Bradley, like just just tons of of uh, American material to to win the war. And that ability to 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 absorb the uh, the, the blitz, the initial attack, um, really changes the framing. And so I want to create a world where there's lots of people who can absorb that initial attack. Somebody somebody uh, was talking about libs of TikTok. Uh, it was some some journalist was like mad because because um, the libs of TikTok lady is now making all kinds of money and 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 very successful and much much happier and better off than she was before and i was like yeah i want every one of those guys to have this like sick feeling in their gut this rock that's like oh no if i expose this person uh i might just make them like way happier and like blow them up and and i i want them to be like looking over their shoulder for that and and so uh so yeah the ability to 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 absorb and metabolize punishment um is is really powerful as far as as far as the the optical chat like if you're if you're dealing with hostile media the more you can engineer a situation you know where you uh i mean that's what trump did right he, he just metabolized hostile media attention all day long that was that was mm -hmm. his magic that was his power yeah it is really important to learn those strategies like you say you know you're going to have a hostile media you know you're going to have this lack of media top cover so you need to develop your strategies with that in mind not only in mind but you need to be judoing that right you need to be turning that against your opponent and, and and using that to your advantage so rufo knows that just asking for the formalization of what the school system already does hurts the school system so just right. going to them and saying, hey, can you just admit, can we, can we just do the thing you're doing or can you admit what you actually do? And just that simple <laughs> thing is really damaging. It, it is, it, he doesn't have to do anything and there's no escape. There's no, there's no way to spin it. Like it's, it's either right. they say, no, you can't take care of your child and it's really important to teach them butt stuff, like I said, or, or they have to say, yes, we will hand you this power flow. There, there, right. there's only it, it, there, there's only two there's only two ways to do that unless they just like do a billion dollars yeah right and so um and so uh you know trump says okay you know just yeah just just punch yourself out screaming at me so that i can just come back and embarrass you with one quick jab you know and, and right. just co just collapse you and so developing that on obviously those are those are particular media tactics that are important for for the for the macro game but in the micro game like you're saying just having that situation where people have avenues they have mutual aid societies they have fraternal orders they have organizations that are setting them up for success they're networking they're building alternatives when the media comes for them, when, you know, the, the, those weapons that have replaced the F-15 are being turned on them, they can go, you know, okay. And then they can just go back to making way more money, maybe have their life improved. And all of a sudden the, that weapon that was so essential to your enemy is now sitting there useless in their hand or making, or they're hesitating to pull the trigger because, it doesn't have a reliable effect anymore. And they might just, they might just make raise someone's power level by freeing them from the shackles of the system. So yeah. I think that is really important. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. The, the effect that, I mean, our whole, our whole, uh, HR secret police situation. Mm-hmm is created by a, a, an incentive structure generated by like a handful of lawsuits, right? It only took a handful of lawsuits for every, every corporation in America to understand like, oh, I better have an internal investigatory service to like, to like look for crime thinkers 
and root them out before I get a lawsuit. And, and it was, this, it was this very straightforward thing to, to generate this like multi-billion dollar, uh, like, like what a, what a flex that the state, the state could get them to hire their, like on their own dime, hire their own political officers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was just a handful of, um, bad consequences to those corporations. And, and that system now has those corporations hamstrung. They are, they are, they are absorbing enormous amounts of cost to keep up with all that nonsense. They're making terrible hiring decisions that they know are terrible and they're making bad investments. That they know are bad investments because of this incentive structure. And so anybody who's operating outside of that system, you, you only have to be like halfway competent to compete. Um, it, you know, obviously they have the benefit of like economies of scale in, in a lot of these industries, but there's like so much outside the system that uh, if you're, if you're light and quick, uh, you can give them a run for their money. I think that's especially true in creative fields. I mean, like, I don't, I don't think it's a, I think it's like a policy choice that Hollywood's as bad as it is. Um, I think that's, that's rooted in like, it's like some bad hiring practices that are, that are sort of mandatory. And, and, you know, our guys, like, you know, I think of like passage prize Lomez running that, that literary competition. And he, he posted a link about like how Pulitzer winners on average, they sell like 300 books if you won the Pulitzer, which used to be this enormous, huge deal. It's like these, these institutions are rotting from the inside. And, and I, you know, um, I, I know, I know mold bugs like expecting a thousand year bug man, Reich. I'm really not, I, I, I think, uh, I, th I think we're already seeing a lot of, a lot of holes that you could cracks in the concrete that something could grow through. And, uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to be like storming the Bastille and, and like the day is saved, but I think there's going to be lots of room to maneuver, uh, in the next, in the next 10 or 20 years. And, and so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's where I want to be. And that's where I want my guys to be is, uh, in those spaces where we are not bound by the rules that these people are bound by and, and people see us, they watch us operate outside that framework safely. And then you've got, and then you've got your bubble, like we talked about, your 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 safe zone, where uh, it's it's possible to operate, and uh, and we don't have to do anything. Like that's that's where the violence comes in, right? Like uh, uh, how are you going to make the world outside your bubble dangerous? You don't have to do anything to make that outside the bubble dangerous because it's already dangerous. It's already chaotic and screwed up. And if you just the, create the a political island formula. of safety, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say the political formula of the state is almost required to make it unsafe for you specifically. So yeah, right. it's already doing that job. Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's, that's the beauty of it is we get to be unambiguous good guys. We don't have to hurt anybody. Um, and, and I, I honestly think that, uh, I honestly think that, that these like, these like billions must die guys, um, are, are making both a moral and a political error that like you, you can be the good guy. You, you, you don't have to hurt anybody. <laughs> Well, the, you know, this is, you know, South Africa, you know, I've had Ernst uh, on Conscious Caracal, um, uh, Ernst Van Zell, he's been on from Afroforum. And what are they doing down there? They're, they're building universities, they're, they're yeah. creating alternative power plants, they're making sure that neighborhoods have water, and they fill potholes, because the governments just can't do it anymore. They, they don't have the capacity. And so as you know, rolling brownouts turn into just complete blackouts, and people have an inability to just get safe access to utilities and stuff that, you know, they, they look like the heroes because they are, they're yeah. doing the work that no one else is doing. They're planting the trees so other people can sit under them, you know? And, and uh, you, like you said, I, I, I am, I am also skeptical of, uh, of mold bag, <laughs> mold bugs, a uh, thousand year bug man, Reich. I, I really, he's got this idea that the only way, any of this gets solved it, like like blue state like blue state uh you know tech ceos will reign in perpetuity so the only the only way they can possibly uh have that have any kind of good uh thing happen in the united states if there's some kind of revival among blue state aristocrats uh but i just don't think that's true like i i, I don't think that in many ways they're capable of it and i don't think that they're the only people capable of 
of uh, making positive change. Um, and no, so I, yeah, it's it's. I, I think he has a lot of faith in the capacity of the system to select for excellence, and I think he's probably right. Uh, but like his information's a little old. Like I, I think I think uh, we used to be pretty good at selecting for excellence, and so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, right? And there's a lot of still really excellent people in the elite, but there's also a lot of really excellent people who are not. And uh, to some extent, because they've always been hard to find, but to some extent, because they're getting, uh, the system is deliberately making itself worse at identifying them and elevating them. Yeah. Um, but I do, I, I love what he says about seduction and revival. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that, uh, when change comes, it's going to be a beautiful thing. It's going to be something that 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 is uh, is joyous and 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 beautiful. And I think um, he's 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 right about uh, our situation. Like like the the South Africa. You know, if if those guys took this really um aggressive hostile tack to i mean you know I've, the south african government's marxist and, and hideously corrupt and if they took this like really aggressive like justifiable tack against that state um it would go worse for them than mm -hmm. if they were to just build shit and make things better and uh i i i uh yeah, I, I think that I think that has to be the approach, and it's more fun anyway. <laughs> well, we are going to pivot over to the questions of the people here, Rick, real quick. But before we do, can you tell everybody where to find your stuff, exit all that? Yeah, so uh, uh, it's extradeadjcb.substack.com is the Substack. Exitgroup.us is for the group. Um, there's exitgroup.substack.com if you want to do that, and then um, extradeadjcb on Twitter. Awesome. And let's go to Creeper Weirdo here for $5. People get interested in politics because politics becomes interested in them. So like Gamergate. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I have an old video uh, that specifically says that uh, Gamergate was uh, kind of the instance that revealed the total state for a lot of people. A lot of people uh, who otherwise would have been completely apolitical wouldn't have thought about this. It wouldn't have mattered to them. As silly as it might seem in some ways, um, Gamergate was the thing that opened their eyes because if this theoretically totally trivial thing had to be completely permeated with state propaganda, then what else had to be completely delusion state propaganda? And once you've seen it, once you've noticed, it's hard to take that blue pill again. It's like, you know, and the, the accusation of like uh, the sort of basement dwelling chud, right? Hmm. It's like, like lean into that. Like, like, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm an unemployed. I live with my mom. I sit in my basement, and you can't leave that guy alone. Like, right. what do you got to do to be left alone? <laughs> I just wanted a game. <laughs> yeah, I just just wanted to play video games. All right, uh, Creeper Weirdo <laughs> again for two dollars. Hey, groomer, leave those kids alone. Yep, it's it's not rocket science. All right, so let's see here. I know we got a few more. Uh. Super Joe's midlife crisis for $10. Thank you very much. The problem is that the total state wipes out all voluntary legal attempts to exit, uh, skip homesteading, uh, go straight to Mafia Triad, Yakuza, Omerta. So you're right that eventually they, they try to do this, right? This is a slow thing. But as Bennett pointed out, every time they do, uh, their power gets more brittle and it becomes more obvious. And uh, if you... If you get rid of every option to exit, if you get rid of every option to stabilize and create, create that equilibrium, then as been pointed out, people will be looking for something else, right? So, so the very act of trying to shut all the exits down creates the desire to find power flows outside. And that's, that is where, that is where mafias come from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, like, they, they do, they, they, they grow in response to the inability or unwillingness of the state to create security uh and i would say you know you, everybody's got to manage their own business but like don't don't show up early to that party that's all i can tell you <laughs> yeah. seems like a bad bad move 
Don't be the first one on that. Yeah. Uh, Krupa Weirdo <laughs> for $5. Even if the world uh, would end tomorrow, I would still plant a tree today. Let's see. And then Matty Ice here for $10. Uh, building alternatives is the way to go, but it seems to me that they will come after you. A successful institution doing its own thing shows a failure of the ruler. Your success equals legitimacy. Yeah, I hear this a lot. Uh, I've asked uh, I've asked Ernst this when he's been on, um, and, and we'll definitely get your response. But his response is like, okay, so we just give up. We just pack it in. We just call it a day. Like, are, are you going to be the last generation? Are you the last man because you're so weak that you're you're scared? Like, yes, of course, there's a possibility the state will come for you. But if you don't do something, there will never be an alternative if people need it, if the state is unable to, you know, to do its job. I, you can make their lies ridiculous. You really can. You, like, they'll, like, they'll lie about you, sure, but you can make those lies silly. And, and you can... You can uh, you can make their propaganda job harder. And I would say, yeah, fundamentally, any anybody who, who, who comes into my replies on Twitter and is like, you know, give up, cope, what, like they love cope. It's like, it's like, all right, then go crawl in a hole, man. Like, get, get out of my, like, why is it so important to you that like nobody else tries anything like why like why do you like if if it doesn't matter then it doesn't matter get out of my mentions yeah. <laughs> I, I used uh cope in an article today and uh the the blaze was like we don't know what that means <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> i was like yeah i guess that is a little online isn't it i, I should probably <laughs> should probably use a different different phrasing there um but uh kg there for five dollars uh thanks guys great chat well thank you kg really appreciate it really appreciate everybody uh who came by everybody who donated your questions are always great a lot of fun um great talking to uh to bennett of course as well i think this is a really excellent piece you should go check out the original it's 100 percent worth listening to uh, all, all the way through to, to, to make sure you get all the nuances. Uh, make sure you're checking out his stuff. Make sure you're checking out Exit. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't complain about uh, not being able to do something if you're not taking those those really basic step guy, steps, guys. So make sure that you're looking into options like that. Anything else you wanted to plug or anything we should be looking for? Anything like that before we go, Mr. Bennett? Uh, well, th there's also the Exit podcast where I interview some of the guys in the group. I interview, uh, I, I, I posted this episode on there as well. Um, it's pretty easy to find on Spotify. I don't know if you want to put in the show notes or something, but uh, but yeah, that's that's the other one. Sure, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, again, if you it's your first time here, of course, make sure to subscribe. If you haven't gone ahead and joined the podcast, you can do so at any of your major podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, all that stuff. If you do, make sure you leave a rating and a review. I uh, should have a new piece up on The Blaze probably like right now-ish, so you can go check that out if you want, talking about the lab leak theory, the COVID ratchet and all that stuff. That has been coming out recently this week. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I will talk to you next time. <laughs>